Hey, what's going on guys? Welcome to another episode of an ongoing series where we basically take the camera anywhere we want to try to find secrets and new discoveries to some of our favorite games. And this time around, I just beat Final Fantasy X for the very first time in my life. And because of that, I have a save file for every single point in the game, which I use to look at the game out of bounds. But all right, let's do less talking here and show you what we got. All right, first, let's start with the Blitzball Stadium. Now, the version that we're using for this video is the HD remaster. And so if we take the camera close up to the audience here in this version, you can see that they're really well defined. It's very easy to see what clothing they're wearing, what gender they are, everything. However, the noclip.website seems to use the original PlayStation 2 version, and if you take the camera over to them, you can see that they are much more simplistic. It's all very fascinating, and while I leave you to consider the differences and why they need to exist in the first place, let's pan the camera out as far as we can so we can see the entirety of the Blitzball Stadium in one shot. Now let's just jump right into it guys, let's talk about Sin. During this fight you can see most of Sin's body, even though it doesn't normally get you every single angle of the boss, and the reason for that is because he's not fully modeled. Any angle in which you would not be able to see him, there is no modeling there. But a lot of people want to know about the city on top of his head, and there is some really interesting information about this. So taking the camera over here so you can see it, really soak in all the different buildings and how they're positioned and everything, because I'm about to blow your minds. No, you never visit this area on top of Sin's head, technically. It seems that the developers modeled this area for you to have visited at one point, but the player doesn't technically do it on top of Sin's head. Instead, it's at the bottom of Lake Makalania. That's right. This one little scene that you might remember is a repurposed town that was on top of Sin's head. And taking the camera out can show you that the layouts of the buildings are identical on top of the fact that the butt on top of Sin's head that usually rests behind all these buildings is also modeled, meaning that this is straight up a model rip of the area on top of Sin's head. Now let's take a look at Titus's living situation. There's a lot of stuff to look at in here. It's a really detailed area that you don't get a great look at. And when we take the camera up to things, you might be surprised by what we find. The first one is this really low quality image here. If you didn't know what this image was, it almost looks like a person in a white shirt holding another person. But thanks to Slack Rot over on Twitter, I was able to find out that this is a beta illustration of when Final Fantasy X was using the working title of 17 Angelic Impact X Devil Shock. And as you can see here, I've overlaid that image with the one that was actually used in Final Fantasy X. A nice little touch. Now, because you don't get a close look at a lot of items, the developers kind of cut some corners here and there. Here's a picture of some boots that clearly have a texture that's not meant for them. Looks like it's almost meant for a metal box or a metal shutter, and it's not easy to read, but my best guess would be 1W Steel Wheels 66 Bell Crank. And this texture is used on a number of things inside this room. And here's a last minute update for you. While looking at this and recording, I was thinking to myself, the remaster does a lot of things differently with textures. Let's just see if they do anything different here. And boy, am I glad I did, because the picture that we were just talking about was completely changed to an artist's interpretation of what that image was supposed to be. In fact, it's a little fun to do an overlay for each image and see how it just stacks up differently. Also, the catalyst for even going into the remaster version, which is the boots, still have that blue texture. I was shocked by that, but they still did make a change. Instead of having English words, it now has made up characters to look like another language. Yeah, that really makes it worth it looking into both versions of the game. By the way, if you appreciate all the hard work, just making sure that you're subscribed is a nice way of showing thanks. Now, there's lots of different maps of the past Xanarkand, but this one in particular really encapsulates the scope of Xanarkand. Xanarkand, which makes for the most impressive zoom out of the entire selection. So the background is comprised of three different rings, and all three rings has various textures depicting various buildings, all to give a sense of parallax scrolling, as well as depth. And then beyond that are waterfalls that also have buildings on them. Combine that with the Sky Dome, and you have one beautiful looking environment, probably one of the best ones you're ever going to find on the PlayStation 2. Here's one of the environments at night that doesn't have nearly as much detail to it. It's still utterly amazing what the developers were able to do with such a limited amount of hardware.
Next, I wanted to get this one out of the way because I thought it was really cool. When I found out that there is an actual 3D model of the map, I got excited because I knew I was going to be able to boundary break this someday. So what you're looking at here is the PlayStation 2 version, which is a lot lower in detail and is not that fun to look at up close. But the remastered version did significant updates to the detail of the map. And since it's in game as well, we can look at the Fahrenheit and its low poly glory, as well as the finer details of this map. And we can also zoom it all the way out to see when the ocean ends, only to reveal a giant sky texture that is normally reserved for the cockpit of the Fahrenheit. Now it's time to talk about some absolutely crazy stuff, the faith. Essentially, every single chamber that has a faith in it has extra details that the player would never be able to see. Taking the camera underneath these models show that they are 3D and surprisingly not 2D textures, and you get varying degrees of modeling depending on which faith you look at. Some of them have features like a nose but no eyes, and some have sort of a dark texture to represent that they used to have eyes. It's almost as if the artists were playing it by ear for each faith and eventually got to a point in development where they understood how much of the faith was going to be seen by the player and were adjusting how these models looked based on that. All right, next up we're talking about fruit. This might seem a little silly to all of you, but when I was playing this game, the fruit on the table in the banquet hall here was really strikingly cool looking to me. And I was like, oh, I can't wait to see how this works. Cause there was cutscenes with different angles and everything. Taking the camera over, the fruit on the table in the banquet hall here will show you that it uses really interesting geometry. The bananas each have their own texture. Grapes come in sets of two and grapefruits and pears come in sets of two. And believe me when I say this all works surprisingly, enough so that when I was playing in game, I had to know how it worked. All right, next up, let's talk about teeth. And the question is, how many teeth does Tidus have? And the answer is a pretty normal amount. I know that doesn't sound exciting at all, but that's just a buffer for the weird outlier situation that is Riku. Taking the camera inside of Riku's mouth and showing you how many teeth she has, there is an ungodly amount of teeth that is stored inside of her lips. Seriously, I guess the owl bed are built a little bit differently, or maybe Riku just never lost her baby teeth. Over here in this desert area, we got these sand trap enemies. And what's really cool is that there are two sand pits, one that's meant for the enemy and one that serves is sort of like a casing or static environment that rests below it. And speaking about how enemies function, one of the big requests I got over on Twitter was Seymour's followers that chase you in this area of the game. They want to know if they were stored anywhere or what it looked like when they came out of the doors. And sadly, it's not super interesting. I looked all over this map to see if they were just stored somewhere and no, I couldn't find them. So either they're culled out or they're spawned in. But one little interesting tidbit, I'm gonna have to slow down the footage just to show you. For only a few frames, the lighting on each enemy is neutral, and so they look a little brighter than they're supposed to be. Now, as far as things getting stored out of bounds, there are certain cutscenes where you can see characters that are waiting to be used, like Waka here, who just stands in the hallway all the way up until the exact moment that he's transported into the cutscene, which puts him in front of the doorway. The introductory cutscene for Seymour has all sorts of jumping around for the character models. You'll understand why this is interesting in a moment, but we'll get there. Every time the camera angle changes, you'll see the character models just sort of jump around to where they're needed, to best serve the scene, which is something that's usually very typical in cutscenes in video games. And here's something that's also really cool. When you pick up the objects that give you insight into Jet's memories, there's this blue little effect that is meant to make it look like you're viewing the orb itself. But paying the camera out can show you that it's in fact a transparent blue orb that the game camera sits inside of to pull off that effect. And remember a second ago when I was talking about how characters were just sort of jumping around? Well, here's something that's really interesting. 
Final Fantasy X seems to use motion capture and something that's a little bit uncommon in video games, especially high-end video games, is that despite the fact that the camera never shows you the entire body of Titus during some of these scenes, his legs are animated fairly well, making the scene somewhat functional when you look at it from out of bounds. I know that some of you guys are sort of not impressed by this, but here's an example that I love to show off to people of another game called The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess, where the camera is supposed to be focused on Epona's head and Link's upper torso. And if you look down below, you can see that they did not animate the horse's legs, and so it looks really awkward. That's what you typically see in a cutscene like this. Ah! What am I supposed to say? You tell me it's my decision, but I don't have a choice, do I? You're the only one who can tell me what's going on anyways. I have to go with you. I have to. And now for no other reason other than the fact that Vinnie Vinesaw suggested that I do this for you guys. Here is the laughing scene from Final Fantasy X shown at different angles. Once again, you're going to see here that the legs of the characters are animated completely when normally that wouldn't be shown to you. You probably shouldn't laugh anymore. And also before that scene starts, you can see another model of Titus being stored out of bounds. This is the model of Titus that's going to actually be used in the cutscene. I'm sorry, just one more example. This is the introduction, and you might remember that it has this close-up of Yuna, and it has Titus's hand on her shoulder. Again, normally, in order to perfect a shot like this, the animators would just do really wacky things with the Titus model just to keep him out of frame, but keep the hand in. But again, shockingly, taking the camera out will show you a full body animation that never gets seen by the player. All right, now let's talk about models. And normally on this show, we would only talk about something like birds, like for example, these seagulls that are right at the very beginning of the game. Here you can see a little bit of an error on the tip of the nose. There seems to be a little bit of alpha going on with the texture. And no, this is not a texture that was cleaned up for the remaster. I suppose this one was just too far away at all times to even bother with. And then let's talk about the shoe puff. Shoe puff is another character in this game that has two separate models. One of the most surprising things about Final Fantasy X is the developer's dedication to resource management and that dedication extends itself to many different models for basically the same characters. You just saw the lower poly model shoe puff. Here's the high poly model shoe puff that they ride upon before the owl bed tries to capture Yuna. Then we got the big daddy jet model and there is the briefest moment where there's proof that you can see that he has a lower torso. Taking the camera down below can show you that it's not only modeled on all sides but he has a leg exposure just like his human model which is a heck of a lot of detail that we were never meant to see wanted to do a close-up of this form of Seymour, and although I didn't capture footage for it, yes, the Seymour model inside of this boss is there already before Seymour fuses with it. And I just wanted to show you all that detail up close because it usually has the entire boss in one shot, and so getting a close-up of Seymour here isn't something that you get to see. And then there's the many quote-unquote forms of Unaleska. I say quote-unquote because it's technically all one form, and even in her first form, the entire model that you see by the end of the fight is just stuck underneath the ground. It's kind of cool because you can see the tentacles with the skulls on the end of them in a straightened position. One of the funniest things to mention is the fact that when you defeat Unaleska, her face makes no change in expression, though it is fair to say that there's no reason why it should change if they have no intention of showing her face to the player anyways. And then there's Anima. Initially, she has no second half, but if you use her overdrive, then it'll spawn in. And here's what all that looks like in one shot. Also, this area has a cat over here. Take the camera over to the cat can show you that the cat's face is fully cat. Quite a bit of detail in the eyes. It makes you wonder if the artist ever feels bad that they put all the effort in, only for it to be forever unnoticed by the casual player. And I've always wanted to do a zoom out of this area because it seems kind of expansive, especially with the fact that there's so many trees. And then there's a big honking mini boss in the center of it. And I thought, wow, that'd be a really cool marker for this zoom out to really give the viewer a sense of scale in terms of how big this map actually is. And speaking of this mini boss, a detail that's a little harder to notice is that there's a pool of water inside of its mouth. And if you take the camera inside that pool of water, there's also modeling underneath to house that pool of water.
Here's another cool zoom out of the Maga Sisters overdrive ability. The particle effects that are used for this scene is massive, super huge. And then there's other cool ones like Bahamut who flies through the sky and zooming that out shows you that there's sort of like a half egg shape that also has culling. So you see giant square chunks just sort of go missing. Here's a zoom out of his overdrive ability as well. And then there's Ixion. This Aeon jumps through a sort of glass portal. And I wanted to show that the model is stored behind all this at all times with its limbs sort of scrunched up into its body a bit. And then there's Shiva. Shiva's really cool because if you take a look at Shiva up close while she's being introduced, there's this part of the animation where there's sort of like a mirror house like effect with the ice. And if you take the camera out, you can see how the effect just sort of wraps around her face a little bit. And then there's Ifrit. Ifrit's pretty cool because Yuna gets shot up into the air and you can see how the animation looks without any weird cutaways. And then we got the all bed base here. Sadly, take the camera up and above. We'll show you that the developers were really careful about how to model this area as only a few inches above the camera line does the structure stop in detail. Though it is something to be admired. This area is pretty complicated with a lot of what you can see using a lot of geometry. And here's an area that I was really excited to explore when I was playing the game for myself because it's all fully 3D modeled, which is really surprising to me. And the camera never rotates. Doing that finally can show you what sort of detail you've been missing out on. And surprisingly, there's a lot that's modeled that the player can't see. I, uh, I'm maybe assuming that this is just for brief cutscenes. Obviously, there's no sky dome. You only get a black void. But all the environment that's here is fully modeled on all sides. And earlier, we looked at the map of the game, which included a low poly version of the Fahrenheit model and also included the moving sky that is usually meant for the interior. Well, to not rob you guys of that experience, I want to show you what that room looks like when you move it out when you zoom out of that as well and as you can see the scale of this environment is massive and then there's the mushroom rock aftermath map obviously there's a big attack here lots of people lost their lives and what's really interesting about this is that the character models that are on the beach are part of the environment itself being low poly and also if you take the camera underneath the map you can see that their backs aren't modeled as well and here's something that's really cool the salvage ship at the very beginning of the game sort of anchors into the ruins and the ruins themselves during this map is just a 2d texture and just before you get to the end of the game this giant structure just drops down from the sky and it's all done from an upward angle so using the camera i wanted to just sort of do a tour of the entire model from top to bottom despite the fact that this thing even clips through the sky dome The Sky Domes in Final Fantasy VII Remake are pretty insane. And one of the first ones that's ever in the game is one that you can't normally see by any normal means because it's so dark outside. But taking the camera far outside the environment changes the lighting and it allows you to see that the Sky Dome that's being used here is in fact a real life city with the photographer taking the picture on a rooftop. You can see a tarp on the ground as well as a lantern as well as other pieces of equipment. And if you want to see part one or part two of the Final Fantasy VII Remake episode, I got a link to either one of those videos on the screen right now. Thank you so much for watching the Final Fantasy X one, and I hope to see you Final Fantasy fans again sometime soon.